morning and welcome to COVID Catechism number six. My name is Father Ryan Humphreys. I'm part of the Catholic Underground crew at catholicunderground.tv and the pastor of St. Edward the Confessor Catholic Church in Tallulah, Louisiana. Our topic today is prophecy. Prophecy biblically speaking, prophecy privately, specifically what we might call private revelation, and apocalyptic prophecy. You know, there's, there's a, let, let's start with some history and some vocabulary, and then we can get into some of the meat and some of the reason that folks nowadays are, are so concerned, so anxious in a way that folks years past really weren't. So let's start with, with just what the words mean. So in Judaism, a prophecy usually implied uh, what would happen but it almost always it required a sense of serious interpretation. So the Messiah would come from, from Bethlehem, you know, or the, he will be called a Nazarene. And so the idea is like, well, what does that mean? You know, is, is a Nazarene something that's going to be used in that time or otherwise? And so you had rabbis who would write these long, complicated theological explanations of all of these prophetic words, typically speaking, which were written down and interpreted over the course of a long time. Now, at the same time, you had three kind of categories of prophets. You had temple prophets, who were basically professional prophets. These were professional interpreters and professional preachers of the teachings of Judaism. And so there might be prophecies in the book of Deuteronomy. There are prophecies in the book of Joshua, prophecies in the book of Genesis, but we would say, no, no, the, these, these temple prophets showed up and interpreted and preached what those things meant. We also had rabbis, a word we're much more familiar with nowadays, who were professional uh, theologians, basically, and teachers. They weren't so much there to preach as they were to instruct. Uh, nowadays, we have a distinction between evangelists and teachers. Think in the same sort of way. Professional preacher versus professional theologian. And then you had the prophets. Now, the prophets were the ones who showed up from time to time, and they would go walking around, and they would preach, and they would teach. But it was not Judaism 101. It was the Lord is going to do something big. And so these are folks like Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah who are saying things that are not to be found in the, the, the Pentateuch, not to be found in the first five books of the Bible, not to be found in the law. These are new things that the Lord is trying to tell us, maybe about the future, maybe about the present. And so the prophets, when it comes to Judaism, in the Old Testament, that's kind of the way it plays out. Now, in the New Testament, prophecies, or the word prophecy is almost always applied to the words of Jesus. And so Jesus says, no one knows the day or the hour. Jesus says, you will not taste death until you have found the kingdom of heaven. And prophets, rabbis, temple priests, none of these folks have a place, at least under those titles, in the new way, as Jesus called it, or as the apostles called it, the way of Christian living. They were replaced by bishops, uh, which were called episcopoi in many places, deacons, elders, and later by priests. They're not the same thing, though. It's not as if a priest is a professional preacher and a deacon is a professional theologian. The whole Jewish structure of prophets goes away and is replaced by a, a new administrative structure. And so prophecies and prophets are thought to kind of be at an end. That doesn't mean there's no mysticism. That doesn't mean that the Lord is not speaking prophetic words through people like Justin Martyr, but it does mean that there's just a different mindset happening. So when we think about prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel, we don't want to simply move forward and say, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, Justin Martyr and, and Hippolytus, they're just a new version of Isaiah and Ezekiel. Very, very different mentality, very different kind of idea when we say the word prophecy. In the early church, which includes St. John at Patmos in the 90s AD, um, interpretations and teachings could be considered prophetic. 
you know, you might say, well, look, this, this verse here talking about Moses was actually talking about Christ. And this verse here talking about Isaiah's preaching about the suffering servant, that was really about Christ. And, so, and then, too, the idea was that's also my spiritual life. And so when Moses does this, that applies to Christ, but it also applies to my spiritual life. And so you get what we call the patristic mode of interpretation, where suddenly the scriptures and the words of Jesus are meant to apply well above and beyond merely historical, but they're meant to have uh, an uh, application to the life of Jesus, an application to the moral life, and then an application to my own spiritual life. This is also the time, though, when mystical prophecies given in prayer start to really become something that the church has to do something with. In, in Judaism, you had the Lord said, you know, and so, okay, that's fine, the Lord said. He said it in the scripture, maybe he said it through one of the big prophets. But now in Christianity, when Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and Jesus is the final revelation of God, why do we need mystical people having mystical visions? What, what, why didn't Jesus say it when he was here? And that church really has to ask some questions about what the deal is with that. How do we understand it? Now, in the early church, this is maybe the first three or four hundred years, most of these mystical prophecies, um, which are given in prayer, are about answering pressing questions that the church is really kind of deal, trying to deal with and directing the community or the bishop. You know, someone has a mystical vision like Justin Martyr, and he's saying, this is how we should understand the Mass. Or here is some mystical vision about what the bishop should do. Or St. Augustine has a mystical vision about having to go to this city or saying that to, to whoever. Or a pope has a mystical vision that there's going to be a great invader, and then suddenly one of the, the, this army of, 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 va of vandals shows up at the door, and so he goes out and says, let me negotiate to bring an end to Attila the Huns, you know, conquest of, of whatever. And so you have these kind of things that are, are about the future. They are prophetic, but there's a sense of they're directed toward the here and now. They're not about in 275 years, this will happen. The mystical prophecies of the early church are almost always directed toward understanding the faith and how do we understand the words of Jesus in the context of the Roman Empire, in the context of the collapsing Roman Empire, in the context of living in the Eastern Roman Empire, in the context of living in Hispania, which is no longer controlled by the Romans. You know, so we have a lot of different questions being asked. All of these things, which are given as kind of mystical prophecies, apply there. It's also important to remember that in the early church, there was no question that the bishop was the only last word on all teachings, all mystical visions, everything. So it doesn't matter how holy somebody is. If that holy person knocks on the door of the bishop and says, the Holy Spirit told me this, the bishop either has the thumbs up or the thumbs down, and there is absolutely no questioning what he says. And so that's worth keeping in mind because that's not going to be the case as we go a little further along. Now, as the church grows and we get into the fourth century and we start moving toward really the middle thousand years, say 400s or 500s or so through the 15th century, the 1400, so about a thousand years between the five and the 15, we start having a further division of what it means to speak with a prophetic voice. There, you know, so, so we still have plenty of mystics. There are plenty of mystics who have mystical experiences. Most of these are monks and nuns. You have people like Bernard of Clairvaux, Hildegard of Bingen, Hugh of St. Victor, Angela of Foligno, St. Gertrude, Julian of Norwich, Catherine of Siena, Joan of Arc. We have plenty of mystical people, but we restructure the way that we think about prophetic teaching, and specifically the prophetic teaching of the Bible, of the tradition of the church, and then the magisterium, which, is, which speaks with a prophetic voice, which speaks with the prophetic mission of Jesus, who is priest, prophet, and king. And so we start to have a distinction between charismatic, charismatic teaching, which we would call evangelization nowadays, 
between catechumenate teaching, which we would call catechism nowadays, and between mystagogical teaching, which we would call kind of training in the spiritual life, and then you have theological study. So you start to have real serious discussion of this council taught this about the natures of Jesus Christ as true God and true man. What does that mean for us? The natural law indicates that, you know, that we have these rights as human beings, these obligations as human beings. Let's start hammering out what that is. And so you have people like Augustine who are writing these thorough and complete theological treaties proving the existence of God from the fact that the number zero exists, you know, and, and, and people who are doing real theological work, speaking with a prophetic voice, almost always these people are clergy, because the clergy is a, a, a comes from a Latin word meaning clerk, which is somebody who can read and write, you know, so the clergy class in that middle thousand years are basically the folks who can read and write for the most part. And so the clergy are most of the ones doing the theological study because they're the most of the ones doing any of the study. But we have these kind of distinctions starting to arise. All of these things are considered a prophetic voice. Being an evangelist is a prophetic task. Being a teacher or a catechist is a prophetic task. Being a mystagogical teacher, almost always that was the, the priest who had just baptized somebody, but being a mystagogical teacher was to speak with a prophetic voice. And so prophecy becomes less associated with mysticism and more associated with the daily work of the church. But like I said, the mystics are still there. They're mostly monks and nuns, and you have you know, big names like Bernard of Clairvaux, you have Joan of Arc, you know, these, are, these are folks who, who are big deals, but most of their visions are not prophetic in the sense of this is what the future holds. Most of these visions are oriented inward toward the spiritual life, toward the direction of the community, toward what is, is, is necessary for us to do right now. It's not about what will come in a hundred years time. For the most part, these mystical visions are people saying the Blessed Virgin Mary wants us to honor her birth, or we need to pray the rosary, or we need to use the brown scapular. You know, these are, these are things that are really oriented toward the sanctification of the world, and less toward what is to come. Remember, this is the time when the Black Plague is happening. And even in the midst of that, people are not, generally speaking, worrying themselves about, about what the end of the world will look like. Prophecy at this point is mostly oriented inward. Now, once we get to the Protestant Revolt, 16th century, everything changes. We enter a genuinely new era in world history, and we enter a new era in the church, because this is the first time that a heresy is not going to get stamped out. This is the first time that the, the Christian church is generally going to tear itself into pieces, and you're going to have orthodoxy, and then you're going to have this heresy, the heresy of Protestantism, existing in parallel for the foreseeable future. Now, I mean, this happened in 1066, way back when we had the Eastern and Western churches, but that's a schism. These are valid churches with valid teaching who disagree on some extremely specific points associated with jurisdiction and law. The Protestant heresy is a full-on heresy that does not teach the truth about Jesus Christ, that rejects the sacraments of the church. So you have here a, a heretical sect growing and thriving and the church making no ground to shut it down. So there really is an entirely distinct moment in Christian history, one that does not get enough attention from modern day Christians. When that happens though, prophecy begins to change dramatically. Our perspective on prophecy changes dramatically. Remember, right after the Protestant revolt takes place, our Lady of Guadalupe shows up on the scene. And while there have been Marian visions going all the way back, when Our Lady of Guadalupe shows up, something different is happening. Because her arrival brings with it 14 million converts from the, the Middle Americas and the former Aztec Empire. And so 
Our Lady of Guadalupe is a giant big deal in the 1530s. Then we're going to have a string of Marian apparitions, and I mean no joke, serious, intense Marian apparitions. You're going to have Our Lady of Good Success. You're going to have Our Lady of La Salette, Our Lady of Lourdes. You're going to have people like Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross show up on the scenes, and these are serious mystics. These are people who are writing in the spiritual life and experiencing God in a way that is fundamentally supernatural. You know, this is when you start to see people like Joseph of Cupertino, who, who, who when he prays, no joke, floats off the ground. And he is the patron of aviators because it was considered an annoying, co uh, you know, regular occurrence. When he would float off the ground, the wind would catch him. This is in Cupertino, Italy. And he would fly across the fields completely in ecstasy praying. And the, the people, the monks, would then have to jog miles to go collect him and drag him back if he was still floating or carry him if he wasn't. I mean, you're like, it seems comical and absurd, but the stories were so common that the people in the area just took this to be just part of the normal, you know, this is what happens with monks sometimes. They start to levitate. You know, so you have a lot of these incredible mystical things happening. At the same time, you have St. Anne Catherine Emmerich, or Blessed Anne Catherine em Emmerich, writing her incredible revelation of the passion, dolorous passion of Jesus and the dolorous passion of Mary. You have Catherine Labore and Rue de Bach and all of the, the great French mysticism that gives us the miraculous medal and those, those sorts of, of devotions. You have St. John Bosco. You have tons and tons and tons of mystical saints who are writing not just about the way the world is, not just about the spiritual life, but now writing about what is to come. And so it's after the Protestant Revolt in the 16th century that we start to say, what is the end of the world going to look like? And when Mary starts showing up and talking about, you've got to pray the rosary and you have to do penance, and the big word is chastisements. We start to hear constantly from all angles, from Mary, from the saints, that there are chastisements coming, punishments that are coming, great offenses against God are taking place, and God intends to bring forth chastisement for us. And this, is, this era, the 1600s until now, really is the, the moment of what we might call eschatological theology. When people start to really ask questions about the end of the world, about the second coming of Jesus, we start to get tons of private revelation. And this is different than before because in years past, a saint may have written in her journal or his journal something. They may have told their spiritual director or mentioned it to the bishop. But for the most part, you just don't have pages and pages and pages of private revelation, which is associated with Saint so-and-so. Bernard gave some crazy sermons, you know, in Clairvaux. Hildegard of Bingen wrote some amazing things and some deep spirituality. Saint Gertrude wrote some stuff about purgatory. But for the most part, we don't say this is Gertrude's revelation. We simply say the Lord said these things and Gertrude was just the vessel he said it through. But nowadays, once we get into the modern era, we start getting a lot of people saying this is the prophecy of St. John Bosco. This is the way that Teresa of Avila thinks about the spiritual life. This is also the time, we should note, about a hundred years after the Protestant revolt gets going, of the Anabaptists. Now, the Anabaptists are an interesting crowd because this is the first time, and this is kind of the, the second generation of Calvinists, who believe that the Holy Spirit speaks to every single one of us, and so any one of us can become a mystic without any connection whatsoever to the spiritual life, without any connection whatsoever to prayer, without any connection whatsoever to the sacraments. The Holy Spirit just speaks. And if you study the history of the Anabaptists, there are some wacky, wacky stories. If you really want a story, go look up Munster. Munster uh, and the Anabaptists. Just type it into Google. M-U-N-S-T-E-R, I believe. Uh, and, and the Anabaptists. A-N-A, Baptists. It's bonkers. These are people who believe the Holy Spirit was speaking to them. They basically conducted a military coup to take over the city, threw out everybody else. It's complete lunacy. And yet that's become a tenet of modern-day Protestant Christianity that not only can the Holy Spirit, 
But, the, but that's the premise of Christianity. The Holy Spirit will tell you anything you actually need to know, and the rest is just up in the air. You know, and it's, it's, it's completely irrational, but the whole notion of it is, is that the Holy Spirit will speak to me, and that's, that's the only thing I need to know in terms of God. And if I believe wrongly about Jesus, or I believe wrongly about the Bible, it doesn't matter. The only value of those things is to give God a way to speak to me, and so it doesn't matter if I interpret the Bible rightly. It doesn't matter if I understand who Jesus is rightly, as long as I have a personal relationship with him. And as irrational as that seems, that's become kind of a defining characteristic of modernity. Now, once we get past, or once we get into, deeply into this moment in history, prophecy becomes something very different. We've had, for the longest time, prophecies, mystical moments, where, where prophecy was rather seen in two parts. There was the mystical, and then there was the ordinary work of the church. And biblical prophecy we could think of as the ordinary work of the church, and mystical prophecy we can think of as private revelations. Maybe that's necessary for the whole church, maybe it's not. The biblical stuff definitely has to be interpreted. After all, the biblical prophecies were not written in English, they were written in other languages, and every translation is by its nature an interpretation. And so biblical and private revelation, uh, private prophecy rather, becomes something that's just a, that, that's part of the church. In our era, the biblical, private, and apocalyptic prophecies start to blur together. And of course, the 19th or the 20th century begins with the explosion in the United States and ultimately in the Western world of Pentecostalism. The idea that the Holy Spirit will move absolutely powerfully, and in fact that it must. And that if you don't have mystical experiences, you're not adequately Christian. If you're not baptized in the Holy Ghost, if you're not praying in tongues, then you are lacking a fundamental part of the Christian experience. And the idea that supernaturality and mysticism are not just you know, a possibility, but they're an expectation. And accompanying that mentality, which has become kind of universal among Christians, you have Our Lady of Fatima, Our Lady of Nock, Our Lady of Kibeho, Our Lady of Akita, Our Lady of Garabandal, uh, Our Lady of Palmain, Our Lady of, of Gietzwald in, uh, in Poland, uh, Our Lady of Finica Batania. You have Our Lady showing up just in, in unprecedented numbers to all sorts of people. You also have hundreds upon hundreds of self-proclaimed mystics, stigmatists, visionaries, both Catholic and Protestant, all claiming to be mystics uh, or having supernatural communication with the Lord, and so many of them throwing up red flags, so many of them publishing books for profit to share the word of the Lord that the Lord has given to them, and that, that may in fact be different or even contrary to the scriptures, to history, whatever. You have visionaries and mystics who are taking a break from their mysticism or their stigmata to go to Disneyland or to go give talks or to run workshops to engage in inner healing, which is a completely nonsensical idea. You have all of this kind of, this, this new age, neo-pagan, neo-mystic kind of stuff, which is swirled around and, and which is this kind of, which is all, all claims to be the prophecy of the Holy Spirit. And most of this stuff, in, in terms of just a quick look at the Bible, is exactly what the Antichrist would bring forward. It's all complete lunacy. And, and yet, that's the nature of prophecy in the modern world. That's the nature of the way that we're instructed to think about prophecy in the modern world. Now, Father Ryan, I have a question. Some of this stuff is clearly inconsistent with Christianity, but you judge a tree by its fruits, and some of these people have good fruits. Benny Hinn is healing people. You have the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, which is, I mean, equal parts incredibly good, orthodox, faithful, and complete lunacy. 
And you have people within that who are absolutely doing what the Holy Spirit wants them to do, absolutely hearing honestly what it is the Lord wants to do, and they're bearing good fruit. I mean, I began my life, in this, my spiritual life with the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. I prayed in tongues, I interpreted tongues, and I have a number of memories of experiences that are 100% the real deal. And yet, we have so much blurred together in confusion. How do we understand this? This is where the phrase private revelation becomes a really important thing for us to keep in mind. The Lord is going to speak to all of us. Not in audible words, not in mystical experiences, but the gifts of the Holy Spirit include wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And the Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts if we quiet our hearts and allow ourselves to listen. Meditation is a type of prayer, I talked about a few weeks ago, is a type of prayer in which we quiet ourselves and listen to the Lord. And the Lord reveals himself to us in various ways, usually without a big sense of an idea, but in, even in our sense of we study, we understand, and the Holy Spirit gives us the capacity to understand what this scripture means or what that means to me or whatever the case might be. And so this is one of these incredibly important things we keep in mind. The Holy Spirit will speak to me or to you, but there's a 99.9% .9 chance that the Holy Spirit revealing these things to me or you is for me or you. Your understanding, your experience is not for me. And my understanding, my experience is not for you. When I was first thinking about becoming a priest, I went to a retreat. Um, and I was very, very not, I didn't want to be called. You know, this is something a lot of, of, of priests experience. You didn't want to be called, but you were willing to listen. And so I went to this retreat and I, I kind of gave the Lord an ultimatum. And long story short, I told the Lord, if I open my Bible to exactly this passage, then I'll go to seminary. Otherwise, I won't. And so through a series of, of things, I, I opened my Bible and sure enough, my eyes landed straight on the words, straight on the verse. And I went, oh, well, good Lord, I'm called to be a priest. That was, I believe, very strongly a private revelation of the Holy Spirit to me. It means less than nothing to the other people who were in that room praying with me. It means less than nothing even to you who are watching in terms of giving you a real sense of the Holy Spirit speaking to you. It was incredibly powerful, even supernatural, and unbelievably important to me. And in fact, a lot of us have those kinds of spiritual experiences where the Holy Spirit made it clear that he's on our team, that he's batting for my side, but that doesn't mean that that necessarily is something he wants me to share with other people, certainly not as something that is meant to speak to them the word of the Lord to them. And so we have this idea that private experiences, mystical or otherwise, are given to me, and that's good, but our assumption is that it's not meant to go beyond me, at least not as anything other than an anecdote like I'm sharing it here. Why? Because Jesus has already revealed everything we need for salvation. So what we're getting is what I need to get myself in order and to get my, my situation in place. If I have a revelation, and I believe this is something that the Lord wants to say to my community, the diocese, the world, the church is the ultimate arbiter. And so if I believe the Holy Spirit has said something to me, I should not write a book. I should not establish a ministry or get an LLC. I should go to my bishop, and my bishop needs to be the one who makes that decision. Now, what happens if I have a bishop who I don't think hears the Holy Spirit? What happens if my priest is a jerk? Well, look at history. The Miraculous Medal, uh, Divine Mercy. Both of those devotions in particular, but there are plenty of others, these nuns went to their spiritual directors, and the spiritual directors had their head where the sun don't shine for a bit. Juan Diego went to the bishop who had his head where the sun don't shine for a bit. And you know what? In all these cases, and in fact in a lot more, when you start finding mystical writers through history, the church is generally opposed, but the Holy Spirit opens minds that need to be opened. 
And so if I, if I have a strong belief the Lord wants me to share my thing with the world, I need to go to my bishop. And if my bishop says no, then I need to say, Holy Spirit, you need to open the door. Because there are a lot of people, y'all, a lot of people, mystics, woohoo, who are out there publishing books and running inner healing workshops that are less than useless. They're devastating to faith. They are destructive of the Catholic faith because they are sure that the Holy Spirit is speaking to them and they are entrusting their private mysticism to others and in doing so damaging themselves and damaging others. I mean, we have to just look at Medjugorje and Conyers in our own moment. Both of these places, Medjugorje in, uh, in, in uh, Europe and, and in Conyers, Georgia in the United States, both of these places probably had a genuine experience of the Lord, or Our Lady rather, appearing to them. Both of them had a lot of seers and a lot of the stuff lined up in the beginning, and then both of those situations started cashing in. And now you have the seers at Medjugorje who are all but selling personalized messages from Our Lady, like, you know, a B-list celebrity sells a phone message, you know, from, you know, from me. Hi, this is so-and-so. Glad to call you. It's, it's nonsense. And, and there are people who have had incredible spiritual experiences at Conyers, at Medjugorje, at other places. But because those seers put themselves above the church, because those seers began to cash in on what the Lord offered them, that mysticism has fallen away and become a detriment to the church. And that's what private revelation, why rather private revelation is such a big deal and why we need to be so cautious about it. So what does the Bible have to say about the end of the world? What is the biblical prophecy of the apocalypse. Well, it's relatively straightforward. There's a lot of it, but it all really boils down to about eight things. The Lord will be manifest in his glory. That is, you look and you see and you recognize the glory of God. It's not something that will be hidden. It's not something that will be obfuscated. We will see the manifest glory of God. The day of the Lord, which is the, 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 that day when he comes, will be terrifying. Nobody will be excited to see it. We will all be scared and horrified because the glory of God's majesty is intense. And in fact, what it does is it reveals our own weakness. It reveals our own failures. And so everyone who experiences that will feel utterly and completely naked and exposed. And if we believe that we are above that, we are wrong. The dead will rise physically, in, in, in their bodies, judgment will happen. No one knows the day or the hour, and it cannot be predicted. It cannot be predicted. And that means the rapture is not a thing. It's not a real thing that was invented 100 years ago, in large part because it was considered a good way to get mostly Pentecostals, but also, you know, uh, uh, circuit preachers, revivals. It was considered a good way to get circuit, circuit preacher revivals to get people in seats. It is not a biblical idea. It is lunacy. And so the, the rapture is not a thing because no one knows the day or the hour. It cannot be predicted. All creation, all that exists except for heaven, purgatory, and hell will cease to exist. It won't explode. It won't melt. As, we don't need to know about those details. At this point, the atoms could simply stop being atoms, and there you go. It's, it ceases to exist in any meaningful way. Purgatory will cease to exist when the last soul leaves. That'll probably be me. Uh, and so, you know, it'll be one of these things where when I finally, finally enter into eternal life in heaven in 468 million years, then I turn the lights off and purgatory ceases to exist. But whoever the last soul in purgatory is, when they enter into beatitude, that ceases to exist, and all that remains is God. And then those, all that remains of his creation is heaven and hell. And everything else that we could talk about, I mean, all the things, whether we're talking about rivers of blood, whether we're talking about you know, where it happens, whether the, the, the Antichrist will come from the east, or you know, whatever, whatever prophecies there are, no one knows the day or the hour. 
God will make himself totally manifest. It will be frightening. Judgment will take place, and all that will remain is heaven and hell. Everything else is window dressing. Everything else is stuff that we can't do anything about. I can either be ready or not. That's it. That's, all, that's what we know, biblically speaking. Now, we could spend six months going through everything that Daniel and Joel and Revelation and Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel have to say about this. But end of the day, that's what it boils down to. Now, what does the tradition of the church have to say about apocalypse? Well, it adds to the biblical notion that purgatory is very real. A great number of saints have seen purgatory and witnessed aspects of it. That's a big deal. Proportionally, we know in our day and age, more people are going to hell in our day and age than in generations past. Our Lady has said that over and over again, and so that's a big deal. There's more people who are going to hell now, it, proportionally speaking, than, than went to hell in years past. And that's largely, I would imagine, because there's so much ridiculous mysticism and the idea that I don't have to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. I just invent whatever religion I like for myself. That's the, the Protestant ethos. And so that, that mentality being so broad means that an increasingly large number of Christians believe that and, you know, there's, there's some other things coming along, but they're certainly part of it. There is something special about the 20th century. That's one of the things that tradition tells us. The 20th century, we're now in the 21st, the 20th century was something special. It was something unique and set aside in history. Uh, we know that the end will be preceded, either distantly or immediately, by the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That's something new. Because we see Mary playing an incredibly important role in the gospel. She plays an incredibly important role in the early church, although that's not as much kept up in the Acts of the Apostles, largely because Paul you know, is the one who is, who is mostly the centerpiece of the Acts, and he wasn't really around Mary all that much. But she plays an incredibly important role. Of course, she shows up and has a big role in the book of Revelation in the 12th chapter. But we know that the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary will precede the day of the Lord. We don't know if it'll be immediately before or be long before, but we know that's coming. Uh, we know that the church in the West will likely shrink dramatically. And we know that there will be a great apostasy among the clergy. That is, there'll be a lot of people who will be members of the clergy, but will not believe as the church believes and will in fact teach error or teach heresy but not leave the church and teach heresy, will remain in the church and teach heresy. And so those are the things the tradition tells us about the end. Um, what I want to do now is have a hard stop and say everything I've said so far is what the church believes. That's the official teaching of the church. It is the accepted, approved teaching of the church and our understanding of prophecy, biblical, uh, private, and, and apocalyptic. This next part, these next few minutes, this is my personal take. Having understood the things I've said and having read a good bit of those things I said and having read a good bit of what's going on now, my own personal read on where we are in history. So stop right here if you have zero interest in Father Ryan's personal read on history. It's not official. Uh, it's not cross-referenced. I'm not going to be citing, you know, particular uh, books and dates and, and sayings. But this is what I sense in prayer. Uh, it's what, when I was talking to people on my sabbatical around Europe, they had the same sort of thoughts. These are when I'm talking to people who are on the left, people who are on the right, people who are traditional, people who are more liberal, people who offer the ordinary mass, priests who offer the extraordinary form, uh, you know, folks, folks on a lot of different fronts. When I start asking them and talking with them and people who are really studied in this stuff, this is what I've kind of started to piece together from the thoughts of people way smarter than me. So this is my take, starting at 40 minutes after, my take, my read, not the official anything, my read on what this moment in history is. Number one, Our Lady is stepping up her game dramatically. 
We had Our Lady of Guadalupe show up, then we had Our Lady of uh, Good Success in Quito in the 1600s, and then things started to really ramp up, and then you got to, uh, you, then you started going to Knock, and then you get to Lourdes, and La Salette, and, and, and Fatima, and then it just, just keeps increasing, and now you have uh, Kibejo, and you have Garabandal, and you have Akita, and you have uh, the, the questionable uh, apparitions at Medjugorje, and, and just the constant and, and ramping up, speeding up visions of Our Lady of Guadalupe, Our, Our Lady always saying the same basic thing. There's, the dangers are coming, big catastrophe, big chastisement, pray the rosary, do penance. You know, so, so you have that going on. Second, you have Pope Leo XIII's vision. Now this was in the late 1800s, right when Our Lady is stepping up her game at Lourdes and La Salette. Pope Leo XIII is in his chapel. He has a profound vision. I'm not going to explain the whole thing, but he hears, coming from the tabernacle in front of him while he is praying the Mass, he hears Jesus and the devil arguing. And the devil says, I can destroy your church so quickly. And Jesus goes, you can't destroy my church. Very reminiscent of the book of Job. And the devil says, no, I can destroy your church. I, just, I need a hundred years and I can completely wipe it off the face of the planet. And, the, and Jesus goes, I'll give you your hundred years just so you can see how wrong you are. When the Pope hears this, he freaks out. He goes and he writes down two prayers, the short prayer to St. Michael the Archangel and the long prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. Those prayers then he insists are to be said at every single Mass. And they were said at every single Mass until 1969. And so you have the vision of Pope Leo XIII, which I believe very strongly began a century, and I believe that century was from 1913 to, or from 1917 to 2017, I believe it was a hundred years in which the Lord took away some of the protections he has applied to the church and in which the devil was given free reign to mess with a lot of priests, a lot of clergy, uh, and, and to do a lot of damage. Uh, and, I, and I have reasons for believing this 1917 to 2017, but that's, that's the story, I, that's what I, I think makes sense. I don't think it's a coincidence that Pope Pius XII was consecrated as a bishop on the same day that the miracle of the sun took place. Um, you know, he, he was this bishop who was expected, or this pope rather, who was expected to be very stable. Uh, he was ordained on that day, and in the first half of his pres or the first half of his pontificate, he was Mr. Stability. He was an incredibly good, solid pope. And then suddenly, and a number of people write about sudden personality changes, in the midst of his pontificate in the 1950s or so, he has a, a sudden shift in personality and immediately begins to let people who are very questionable theologians, you know, people like Augustine Bea and others, you know, very questionable theologians, they, get to, they just start calling all the shots. You have dramatic changes in Holy Week, which opens the door for these huge changes that will follow. You have the influence, sudden and unexpected influence, of the Belgian, Dutch, and German theologians who suddenly show up and start to basically be in charge of the Curia, really kind of out of nowhere. I don't know why this happened, but you have this kind of sudden, unexpected thing start to happen in the middle of Pius XII's pontificate. Um, Our Lady of Good Success in Quito, which is taking place in the 1600s, predicts a huge event in the middle of the 20th century. This is number four. And it, 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 the 1600s, this little nun is there, and, and Our Lady says, look, in the middle of the 20th century, some stuff is going to go down. There's going to be an incredible attack on the family, and it's going to be hugely devastating. A lot of folks are going to go to hell. There's going to be a, a massive attack in the 20th century. You need to pray and ask the Lord to make ready for when that comes. In the middle of the 20th century, we have Humani Vitae, a good document theologically, but it is the impetus for church-wide disobedience, from cardinals down to deacons. I mean, you have just clergy across the board saying you're free to ignore humani vitae and use contraception. And you have, in fact, most lay Catholics being told by their clergy, you are free to disobey that and do whatever you want to do. And you, know, you start to have almost immediately a massive majority of Catholics begin to use birth control, which is a sin, and in fact, a grave sin. And so what you end up having is you have most Catholics nowadays 
I mean, I would say probably in the neighborhood of 85 to 90 percent of married Catholics using contraception, which puts them in an ongoing, unrepented of state of sin. And so you have people who are not in the state of grace receiving Holy Communion, and I think you're pretty much talking about the vast majority of Catholics in that boat. That's a real problem. It's a real issue. And to receive communion in that way is blasphemous. Number five, you have the Second Vatican Council arising as a source of massive division. It's been used as an all-access pass for all sorts of changes to the liturgy, changes to the teaching of the church, uh, changes in the church's authority to teach at all, um, as well as the, the mindset that, you know, the, the church's teaching is a fluid thing that can go here or there. I'm not saying the documents themselves were bad, but I'm saying it has clearly become a kind of, of a talisman of sorts uh, that, that you say, oh, the Second Vatican Council, and you get to hold up your pass and say and teach whatever you want. So we've been kind of in this experimental period for the last 60 years where anybody who says Vatican II is free to do whatever they want to do, and anybody who argues against that is treated like some kind of horrible human being who is contrary and opposed to the work of the Holy Spirit. It's a bit like, like questioning that climate science is an absolute, you know, completed field. Anybody who raises any question whatsoever, even if you're a supporter, is considered a skeptic and a denier and you just can't, you're not even allowed to talk. That's, that's division. That's not from the Holy Spirit. It's not a genuine sense of, of good. It's th that's division. The council itself may be good, but it has been used as a source of division. We should also say that Pope Paul VI wrote memoir after memoir about how he was tricked and manipulated into signing documents that made massive changes to the teaching and practice of the Catholic Church and that he didn't even know were happening. I mean, most famously, the Pentecost octave, he comes down to celebrate Mass on Monday morning, and the, the sacristan puts out a green vestment, and he says, it's the octave of Pentecost. And the guy says, Holy Father, you dissolve that. You got rid of that a month ago. And the Holy Father looks at him dumbfounded and goes, what? Well, I didn't do anything like that. He goes, your signature's on the document. The entire church being played and manipulated in, in big, giant ways, following that council, big, big, big questions, big effects in the middle of the 20th century. In 1960, we were supposed to hear the third secret of Fatima being revealed. That didn't happen for a further 40 years. Um, there are still questions about the completeness of that document, so there's some big question marks about the conclusion, that secret of Our Lady of Fatima, um, and, and then we have Our Lady appearing at Garbandal and, in fact, a number of other places. And then again at Akita saying the same four things. Sin, being unrepented of, chastisement, pray the rosary, offer penance. Um, and at, at Akita, of course, we have the, the very, very strong teaching that bishops will fight against bishops, cardinals will fight against cardinals in the news media and in public. You know, this idea of a great apostasy. And then finally in the years 2000s, there began this incredible uncovering, uncovering of long-standing sin by clergy in the church, by people who operate in the halls of power, politicians and otherwise. We start to see the, the sexual abuse of children by the clergy becoming revealed. Um, and even in, in that happens again in the 2016s where we have further you know, further, this is, you know, this has been happening. We have further prosecutions. We have further reports. And at the same time, we have, in 2017, we have another round of, of bishops being held to account. We have the Me Too folks who are, who are this explosion within Hollywood of all this chil abuse of children, abuse of women, abuse of sexuality all over. And it's all, being, it's all being made to come to light. It's not being hidden anymore. Uh, and then, of course, the Epstein affair becomes its own interesting kind of side question about all these incredibly powerful people and the, the abuse of children, which anyone who is familiar with Satanism will tell you is always at the heart of Satanism. It's the abuse of children. And it's no accident that Our Lady 
is an icon of innocence, of youthful beauty, and of chastity. And so much of these things, especially the stuff we're seeing now, the gross stuff we're seeing now, is effectively the anti-Marian experience. You have the abuse, the sexual abuse and perversion of children, um, you know, which is the exact opposite of the youthful beauty, innocence, and chastity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So that I say all that stuff to say that the putting those pieces together, that's how I understand what's going on in the world today. We have this moment where the 20th century was a century of darkness, a century where the Lord removed some protections from the church, whatever those might be, and opened the door for the, for the devil to come in and do some damage. And the devil did some damage, a lot of damage. But that moment has ended. And now we're seeing this incredible revival happening within the church of the laity and the clergy who are saying, we want our church back. We want genuine orthodoxy. We don't want easy Christianity. We don't want you to tell us that we can do whatever we want to do. And you're seeing a genuine division happening in the church between those who say, I want to follow Jesus and between those who are saying, we want to make this as easy as possible and open up the church so that it basically doesn't teach anything different than the world teaches. And you see that in kind of the German synod stuff going on. And then you see the distinction with the faithful who are saying, no, no, we want to know the true love and power of Jesus Christ. We don't want to be given the easiest possible path. That is not what we desire. Interestingly, the last piece of this whole thing I'm thinking through comes from a young priest who was interviewed in 1969 by the German radio, and his name was Joseph Ratzinger. You might know him better as Benedict XVI, who celebrates his 93rd birthday today. But back then, in 1969, he was interviewed, and he had some incredibly important things to say. And so I'm going to conclude with this, uh, this somewhat long COVID catechism with this. He said, The future of the church can and will issue from those whose roots are deep, and who live from the pure fullness of their faith. It will not issue from those who accommodate themselves merely to the passing moment, or from those who merely criticize others and assume that they are themselves infallible measuring rods. Nor will it issue from those who take the easier road, who sidestep the passion of faith, declaring false and obsolete, tyrannous and legalistic, all that makes demands upon men that hurts them and compels them to sacrifice themselves. Some of those words are shockingly apropos. He also says, from the crisis of today, the church of tomorrow, he's saying this in 1969, from the crisis of today, the church of tomorrow will emerge, a church that has lost much. She will become small and will have to start afresh, more or less from the beginning. She will no longer be able to habit, inhabit many of the edifices she built in prosperity. And as the number of her adherents diminishes, so it will lose many of her social privileges. In contrast to an earlier age, it will be seen as a voluntary society, entered only by free decision. And as a small society, it will make much bigger demands on the initiative of her individual members. But in all the changes at, one, at which one might guess, the church will find her essence afresh and with full conviction in that which was always at her center, faith in the triune God and Jesus Christ, the Son of God made man, and the presence of the Holy Spirit until the end of the world. In faith and prayer, she will again recognize the sacraments as the worship of God and not merely as a subject for liturgical scholarship. The church will be a more spiritual church. This incredible prophecy for me brings together the entire experience of the last hundred years. It brings to me why chastisement and apostasy is happening. It helps me to understand why it is that, the, that Pope Leo XIII had his experience, why Our Lady of Fatima had such a big giant miracle and then everything seemed to go straight to pot for a long time. It helps me to understand why there were divisions and why the Lord has allowed apostasy and divisions within the church. It helps me to understand basically everything that's going on right now and every single aspect of it. The 
idea of the church is in a certain sense shaking loose people who are only sort of, kind of, Christian because it's convenient. And this also strikes me as the way that the Protestant revolt, the Protestant heresy, will ultimately be destroyed, will ultimately be squashed and removed and replaced by Orthodox Christianity, by, by Catholicism. It's, it's an incredibly difficult thing to get our head around, and yet at the same time, the Lord is looking to save souls. And saving souls is not done just by showing up to church on Sunday. Saving souls does not happen just by saying, I'm Catholic, and by receiving communion. It happens when we engage our faith, and our entire lives become built around the purpose of knowing, loving, and serving God, and spending eternity with Him in heaven. And when that happens, our lives change. We can't simply say, my Sundays change. My life changes. And so this has been a very long COVID catechism. Again, I, I, the last 20 minutes have been my thoughts, my ideas, my read on the situation. I cannot pretend um, that, that I understand all things, but I can say that since I started putting these pieces together, I have a great peace in my soul about what's going on in the world around us, even up to and including this, this quarantine that's happening. And so I would certainly encourage you to look into some of these questions. Just to give you a, a, a quick look, if you're interested, look into Our Lady's uh, apparitions of the 20th century. Fascinating question. Look into Pope Leo XIII and his visions uh, related to St. Michael the Archangel. Look into Pope Pius XII's career. Read up on Our Lady of Good Success in Quito, Q-U-I-T-O, Ecuador in the 1600s. Uh, look into some of the effects of the Second Vatican Council, not the texts. The text of the council was a valid council. Of course, the texts are fine. But look into some of the effects and consequences thereof. Um, look into the, the questions related to the third secret of Fatima. And look into Our Lady of Kibeho and Our Lady of Akita in particular. And then finally, start looking at the, the history of, of the sex abuse stuff and what we know has been happening as regards the abuse of children, the questions of homosexuality, and then the roles that people, you know, the way that people like Cardinal McCarrick, uh, former Cardinal McCarrick, the way that they rose, you know, in, in huge, huge power, and the people that they surrounded themselves with, and the people that they put in authority who are still in authority. Those are good questions to ask. And then finally, look up uh, Cardinal Ratzinger's words in 1969. If you just search Google for 1969 Ratzinger prophecy, this will come up. Um, these are things to think about that, that really do give a sense of perspective because the Lord has frequently in the past said that the only way to, to, do, uh, to, to bring about healing is in certain ways to excise that which is dead. And so if that's what we're experiencing, if we're experiencing these chastisements, not at random, uh, not even as punishment, but for the health of of the church at large and for the health of individuals within it who may be con convincing themselves that what they're doing is good and it's not, it could help to understand some things and give us a sense of perspective. So I hope this has been helpful. Again, the last 20 minutes, my opinion, the first 40 minutes, the teaching of the church. Uh, I hope this is helpful while we're all locked in. And if you do have any questions, of course, please feel free to contact me on social media. Please feel free to ask them via text or, uh, or phone call. And I will see you again tomorrow morning with the Latin Mass at 9.15 on Friday morning for Friday in the octave of Easter. God bless you. Bye-bye.